start my Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to make a couple of announcements while we wait for some of the stragglers to join us. First of all, thank you for joining us for our first in a series of Lunch and Learns. Um, traditionally, the GAA has um, hosted bi-monthly webinars in the evening, and um, I have expanded this to now have um, bi-monthly lunch and learns in addition to those webinars for those of you who are unable to meet in the evening. So I hope you'll pay attention and join us for future lunch and learns, and I hope this works for your schedule. So this is the first of the CU opportunities that we have added as a benefit to our memberships. Previously, you had six free CUs per year as a member, and now there are 12 opportunities. So we're excited to be able to do that. I'm also excited to welcome another nonprofit as our first presenter. So very exciting opportunity. Our next month webinar is the traditional time of 6.15 on the Tuesday, and that will be a presentation on starting a tree care apprenticeship program with the TCIA. So I hope you'll join us for that. And then the following month, we're going to, I'm still working on the details, but it will be on the Florida's prescription pruning pro qualification program. So if you'd like to learn more information about that will be a lunch and learn as well. So join us in June for that. I haven't opened up registration for that yet. So be on the lookout for it. And then we also have a couple other exciting programs coming up. I hope you'll join us for our first in-person event of the year, our social hour. It will be held at Lanier Outdoor Equipment, and that's going to be on April 18th, first networking opportunity, so please join us for that. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, but we're going to save all of our questions for the end because hopefully they'll all be answered by Derek's presentation. Um, if you are looking for CEUs, I will also drop a form to fill out in the chat at toward the end of the presentation. So around one o'clock, look for that form to fill out and I'll put that in the chat. And there's also a place in that form. If you have suggestions for future webinars or lunch and learns, please feel free to give me ideas of what you would like to learn about. I'm always looking for good suggestions. So you'll notice that today we will be having a presentation from Derek here, who is not Donna, as it was listed. Derek is the education coordinator for Save Georgia's Hemlocks. David, or excuse me, Derek became a member of Save Georgia Hemlocks in 2016 and has led multiple hemlock treatment projects while conducting clinic and facilitator training and personal property assessments. And he has served as a board member and the SGH education coordinator since 2020. Uh, he's an employee of the Coca-Cola Company. He is the senior executive assistant to the president and board of directors of the National Product Supply Group. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And in his spare time, he enjoys cooking, running, gardening, and spending time in the wilderness while saving hemlocks. He and his husband, Brian, reside in Cherry Log, Georgia with their dog and two cats. Welcome, Derek. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. And I'm going to give you control if you'll give me okay. just a moment. You just tell me when. All right. You're good to go. All right. So I will put presentation up here and share. We'll put this in presenter mode. Great. Does that look like it did when we were testing earlier? You should see yeah. that help, Hemlock, uh, Hemlock Help Clinic page. Looks um, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much for um, having us on behalf of Save George's Hemlocks. It is an honor for us to be able to present to you today. And when Donna, unfortunately, her schedule changed and asked me if I could assist her with presenting today, I was more than excited to do so. I think this is a fantastic opportunity maybe for us to partner with one another and hopefully we can help you and you can help us and we can learn about some hemlocks today. I'll start with my two favorite topics. My first one, me. As Jesse mentioned, I've been a member since 2016 and it's just, it's really become a passion. It's been a fantastic organization to work with and I really enjoy learning all aspects that I can. And you as we'll go through the presentation today and we talk about volunteer opportunities at the end, there's just an endless array of things that can be done, not just treating hemlock trees. 
And then my favorite topic is Save George's Hemlocks. And Donna formalized the organization and single-handedly ran it for a long time, for a while, and founded this in 2012. And it has just really grown into a great organization. We've saved tens of thousands of hemlocks through our volunteer efforts and, and through our outreach, which we'll get into today. This this presentation is the clinic that, that we present to someone that may not know anything about hemlocks at all. They have hemlocks on their property and they just learned that there is an issue. And so some of this may be very high level for you that you uh, may already know. Hopefully there will be some information here that, that will be new to you and helpful as well. So just bear with me if you hear some information you already know. Some of this I will talk through quickly. Some of this is really background information. It's great to know to be able to answer questions to homeowners when you're assessing trees or they may have questions about the hemlock that may not be pertain to how to treat or save them, but it will it will answer their curiosity as to why this is even an issue and how widespread is it and, and why is it important to treat the hemlocks. I will go quickly through some of these, of course, and then we will, of course, get to the, to the important part of treating them and how we do that. So we are a volunteer organization, nonprofit, and we save hemlocks through education and through charitable service and through our volunteer projects and treatment projects. And our mission is to help North Georgians and others uh, preserve, conserve, and restore hemlocks for future generations. We do this through education, which is what we're presenting here today as our clinic education. Uh, we also offer a facilitator training, which is we typically try to do that in person because we are actually doing a practical where we're using equipment and showing people how to measure the trees and treat them in mixed chemical through enabling, through access to hemlock specific instruction and advice and availability of other necessary resources, such as where to purchase chemicals, where to, to find an injector or to find someone that can do that for you if they're physically not able to do so themselves. And then through engagement, and we do that through many different ways, through working with other nonprofits, property owners, and other engagement where we we'll go to festivals, that type of thing, so we can reach out to folks. And we also work with public land managers. Hemlocks are an essential, are essential to our forest and our waterways. They provide food and habitat for 120 species of vertebrates and over 90 species of birds. They provide shade for native plants and they cool temperatures for our trout streams and protection of watersheds and water quality. Unfortunately, as you may, as you already know, the hemlocks are, are being attacked uh, by the woolly adelgid. And unfortunately, these are some not so sightly photos of, of the effect of that. And that is the culprit right there in the upper right hand corner. They're very small and hard to see with the naked eye. But the good news is they can be treated and saved with, with timely attention. It can be done through cultural, chemical, and biological controls. We'll go into that later. And presently, the most effective and economical control is chemical treatment. This method is safe for the environment, groundwater, wildlife, and humans. It's temporary, but it's a very effective control that will last anywhere from, we tell folks, five years. You can get to seven, but we try to not go right to seven so that you don't then have an infestation and it impact the health of the tree. So we try to have a little bit of overlap there. And the hope for the future is that we can find a biological control through the release of predator beetles and other natural agents into infected areas as well. So that's our long-term hope. Um, so today we're going to learn about the hemlock crisis and the services we offer to save the trees and also how to treat trees as well for those of you that have not done so already. And then also how you can help others through Save George's Hemlocks. So we'll go over the help program, hemlocks, woolly adults treatment, and some additional information. So I like to go through, I don't like surprises in the presentation, so I'll try to go through these and have everything pulled up as we go through it, through each slide. So this is just a map of where these are found in nature, native hemlock counties. We offer a hemlock helpline that services the entire U.S. And I actually chatted with Donna last night. We were talking about our repair of the Curowitz injectors. And we are the only only organization that offers repair of the curates because those are no longer in production and neither are the parts. And so we actually have those specifically made from someone that Donna knows that, that we can tool them and make the parts that we need. We offer the help clinics like we're doing today in presentations and then we offer advice on treatment and product methods as well. And then we do offer injectors. We do have a loaner program and other application equipment. And in the upper right, you'll see here uh, this is the Curates. This is the version that is no longer production. These are the majority, I think, of what's out there. And this is a relatively new product that has come out in the past few years. Donna was instrumental in getting that fabricated by the manufacturer. And then we 
each got to test it, give our feedback, and came up with the final prototype. And it is a, it's a great product as well. And then, as I mentioned, we offer the soil injector repair service. Our website, I'm very proud of it. It can be a bit overwhelming. It was for me at first. There is so much information out there that if there's anything out there that I can't answer for you, it's on our website. Just a great resource of information. And feel free to go to our website anytime and, and really explore that. There's just a lot of great information out there. As I mentioned, we volunteer with help projects. That's how I got involved with Donna is with the trees that were on our on the entrance to our prop or to our neighborhood that had never been treated before. When I learned that there was a problem with the hemlock, she came out, she did an assessment, said yes, they can be treated, but there are a lot of trees here, so we need to coordinate a project. And so there were a lot of steps that went on in the background, and we had about 25 or 30 volunteers. That was in 2016. And that is how I, I initially got involved. We also do, and I've also helped with projects on federal and state lands. And then neighborhood hemlock project planning. So even in my own neighborhood, we were fortunate enough, we do have an injector. And so I offer training. And we also, of course, to other neighborhoods that may not be aware, we offer training for them. So we'll go do presentations just to uh, neighborhood uh, neighborhoods that are, are concerned about their hemlocks, of course. Um, we do have hemlocks um, for adoption. And we work with other nonprofits and schools in, in reforestation projects on, on trout streams. We'll get as many volunteers as we can, dozens of trees, and we will go out in one day and just really get a, a good stretch of a river and replant hemlocks where they have been lost. And then there's ongoing citizen science research and sharing of information. We work with UGA and Young Harris and keep in touch with them on the biological experiments that they're conducting. And then we work, of course, as I mentioned, with other organizations. So that is really the HELP program. And so really our helpline is, it goes directly to our executive director, Holly. And she also shares that responsibility with our founder, uh, Donna. And so when they call the helpline, they will get a hold of Holly. And really we can direct them into, usually if it's a, if it's a property owner, attend the clinic. It really will give you the foundation of what you need to know um, and how this can be treated. But of course, there's other opportunities out there for people to volunteer that we can direct them to if they're just wanting to help us. But also we can direct them through our website on if they're looking for someone to help them treat their trees, if they can't do it themselves, how they can find products and chemicals. And there's training and guidelines uh, and guides out on our website as well. We'll go through a couple of uh, slides that just really go over the, and I'll go over this quickly because I'm sure most of you are well aware what a hemlock is. There's the uh, Canadian or Eastern hemlock. Um, its habitat is north or east facing slopes, ravines, and waterways. So unfortunately, there, as some of our photos will show on flat meadows, no other surrounding trees, no terrain to worry about. Unfortunately, that is not the case with the majority of hemlocks. Um, and uh, average maturity, 75 to 100 feet uh, with a 20 to 30 foot spread. So it's a large tree, susceptible to drought. They're slow growing and long, long lived. They're called the, uh, I think the redwood tree of the East Coast, some people will call them. I have seen them, in my opinion, will grow fast in full sun. So I, they're not a slow growing, the majority of them are not in full sun. So that's why they have the reputation for being a slow growing tree. Then they like a cool, humid climate like North Georgia. They like the, our acidic soil and they're very shade tolerant and prefer semi-shade. And so this is the native range, and this also, and it also goes up, you can see, into Canada, but from North Georgia, parts of North Alabama, through Northern Michigan and Wisconsin, all the way up to Maine and parts of Canada. And there again is the map. Now there are, there are some in Atlanta or in Fulton County, but those are typically not native. They've been, they've been planted by man and they can survive. I mean, we actually do have a, a treatment project that's going to come up at, later this year that's in Atlanta that I can talk that I'll talk about later. But most of them are in North Georgia. And then there's the Carolina hemlock. I've seen one of these up close. These are not as common. The range is much smaller than the eastern and it is a smaller tree. The largest difference really is its size, but also the it's more like a bottle brush shape, whereas the eastern hemlock, it's a flatter needle spread, whereas it's more like a bottle brush where the needles are all the way around on the Carolina hemlock. And they can tolerate conditions, uh, lower soil moisture than the, and they tend to be on rocky outcrops, so a little bit more hardy, I think, as far as growing conditions than the eastern. This is the native range, just a small area. I think that's Raven County, 
and then here in North Carolina and up north or up in Virginia. So not as common in North Georgia. This you would think this would be a slide that oh why, why are we even talking about why it matters? Of course they matter to me. Of course it, it's self-explanatory. But we've met some folks that that have grown up in North Georgia and they're they may not even know about this and they don't know why it matters. It's it's a tree is dying. That's the natural course of life. But they may not know how widespread it is that it is attacking every hemlock on the eastern east coast. And and we've had to convince them please please treat your trees. We will help you treat your trees. And we have to convince them that. This is not a natural occurring without the infestation that was introduced in the 50s. This would not have occurred. So they can be saved and it, it's not costly. And so this is why we let them know it's beauty, the beauty, the creativity, the inspiration can be inspired by trees. No one wants to walk through a forest that's all dead trees, of course. And it does help with tourism, of course. Um, again, because no one wants to come visit an area where it's mostly dead trees in a forest. As I mentioned earlier, the, there's an ecological value to wildlife. Many species of invertebrates and birds and mammals and macroinvertebrates have a strong ecological connection with the environment and shade that is provided by the hemlock. And of course, again, it provides shade for plants. And so I think really, of course, this helps with plants that for the hemlock dies, and now it's a, a fully, and I've seen it, in an area that's just full sun. It does change the landscape of what was growing underneath that tree. And then you can also get invasive. Now, this will allow room for invasive species to come in and take hold. They really they help in that aspect as well. Like all trees, there's an environmental value to air quality and to water quality. As, I, as you may know, they really like lower elevation, they like moist soil, and they really like to go along the river, right, around along waterways. And when you have those trees on my property, I have a few that were not treated before we got there, and I'm on about a tenth of a mile of the river, a lot of trees and a lot of hemlocks, and some were just beyond saving. And of course, it's unsightly, then they fall on the property, they fall in the river, and then that does not help with soil conservation with runoff into our streams. The streams warm up, does not help the trout population. And there's definitely a, a relationship there, not only with the air, but all with, also with our waterways as well. As I mentioned, when we're talking to property owners, they want to know, well, what, what's the point? If it's just going to die, it's going to fall. We don't want the tree to die. And if it does, we don't want it to fall on your house. And we try to let them know that, give them an idea of how much it's going to cost me. I have 10 trees on my property. And so to try to give them an idea, letting them know if they do it themselves, there's a cost here. It shows with the cost of a meter culprit and safari versus it is also affordable to have it hired done as well. And if you need it done, you can have it hired out as well. So it's more cost effective than a tree falling on your home or having to go out and clear all of the trees, of course. So again, if you lose your hemlock, to have the tree removed is, is not, it's not as inexpensive as saving the tree, of course. And it does add property value to, like I said, I have, we probably have about 150 to 200 hemlocks on our property, some very large, most of them very small. But if we were to lose all of those trees, it would definitely impact my property value. <clears throat> and there's the property value, beauty and privacy. It does impact our privacy. I lost a couple of trees to a storm between my, my neighbors and I. And so luckily they're great neighbors, but still we don't want to look at each other every time we walk out in the yard. It can help with uh, privacy, as I mentioned, tourism and recreation. And then there's a personal value to the trees as well. And of course, and this is a slide I'll go over quickly, when it comes to economic value um, with tourism, there's many aspects of that that draws that is there economical value in North Georgia. And so it helps with of course, taxes, of course, is always involved, but it does have an impact to the value and economic value to our community as well. So that is an overview about the hemlocks themselves. So now we're going to go on into the problem, right? And this is the meat of the presentation for me is you can't see it. So people, want, it's not easy to see with the naked eye. And so people, want, they can't see it. Then how do we know that there's a problem? What is the issue? And the way that it attacks the tree is it adheres itself to the base of the needle, as you can see on the lower left-hand side here, and, and it takes the nutrients up from the needle dies, the needle falls off, and of course that doesn't regenerate itself, and so eventually when you have too much needle loss, the tree is gonna be lost. It sucks the starches and other nutrients out, so the needle dies and, and eventually the tree will die. 
only attacks hemlock. So that's fortunate, but all hemlocks are vulnerable. And I tell folks, if I've had people tell me, oh, my trees are fine, they look beautiful and they're healthy, I tell them it's only a matter of time. They probably already have a light infestation because there aren't any trees that aren't vulnerable to this. So it's unfortunate. And in massive numbers, and I've seen this before, this is a very thick infestation and that is a tree that can be saved, but time is of the essence, treat it like immediately. People will say, I hear that there's, there are woolly adelgids on the West Coast. Many invasive species from Japan came to the Oregon coast in 1924. It was thought to be indigenous because it was controlled for the most part by native predators, which is a small, a very small beetle. On the East Coast, it was separately introduced from Japan in Virginia in 1951, and there are no company natural predators here, unfortunately. So the spread has just been constant, and now it is seen in every single state within the native hemlock range on the East Coast. The I can't recall if this we go deeper into this, we might, but the beetle that is on the, I think we do go into this later, but the beetle that is on the uh, West Coast, they do have the woolly adelgid, but the beetle keeps it in check. So there is a balance. So there aren't, the beetle will use that as a food source and keeps it in check where the tree is not um, adversely affected. And so we have tried to introduce that beetle here with limited success. And so there are, we're continuing to crossbreed with beetles that do well in our area. But of course, we have to be careful with that. We don't want to introduce a new pest that causes a new problem. And so it does take time to, to test those in labs and get that information before we can start doing something like that. And so it's unfortunately, it wasn't didn't have the success that we thought it, that it would. So it's taking some time, but we're still hopeful. Um, so this just shows how quickly it spread from 2003 through 2012. It was really in all counties in North Georgia. It can spread through through animals, through man. And I paid attention to that. Actually, over the past weekend, I transplanted some hemlocks that were too close to the house that I knew were either going to be cut down or moved. And so I'd rather move them and move them to an area where I knew they would do well. And I was, as I was out there brushing on them, I sat down and took a break and I had woolly adelgids on me. This is the time of year where you can really see those woolly adelgid egg sacs. And they're out right now. And so I had been walking through the woods, rubbing on the trees. And I thought, you know, if I walk into an area that hasn't, has a low infestation or none at all, that can spread. But the majority of the spread is through wind. And it can also be spread through the purchase of trees or transplanted trees from infested areas. So the trees I moved were infested and I moved them, but then treated them as I planted them, of course. But had I not, it could have infested other trees if there were trees nearby that were not. This is an up-close photo of the egg sacs of the woolly adelgid. So this is how most people know that they have the problem, right? This is the easiest way to identify if there is an infestation. Now, there are trees that are so tall you cannot see this up close. So you can look on the ground. Sometimes these branches fall during a storm and you can see underneath a tree if there are any. It's most likely that's where it came from that tree. It's infested. Sometimes if it's really infested, you can even see them on the bark, which not, is not as common. Really the most telltale sign if you can't see the woolly adelgid sacs like this because they're only out a couple times a year in, this, in, this, in these numbers is really through the health of the tree. If you see a hemlock that's not doing well, you can have other diseases, but it's most likely going to be the woolly adelgid. And so this is recognizing it from a distance for trees that you can't get close to or you don't see woolly adelgid evidence on the very lower branches. You can look for woolly adelgids on other trees that are nearby that are closer to the ground and again examine small branches that are lying on the ground. But really, if you see a hemlock that is thin like this or it has a drab, it's not a vibrant green color, it's drab that is thin in foliage, branch dieback definitely can show that it's an advanced infestation. So that's how you can tell from a distance if you can't get close to the tree. Oh, but by the way, all of these trees can be saved. So the progression of signs is the woolly egg sacs on the underside of the branches, the drab green foliage, as I mentioned, thinning of foliage, little to new growth. This is one of my favorite times of the year because the, and you've seen this before, I'm certain, is the new growth on the hemlocks, that sharp, true, bright green. And then you see a healthy hemlock that's very happy and it's putting out that new growth. It's typically the smaller the tree, the earlier you're going to see the new growth. So about a month after you see the new growth on the smaller trees is typically when I've seen 
about a month later when I start seeing it on the larger trees. And I just really love to see a tree that's got that just full hue of chartreuse green. It means that it's healthy. So if you see that new growth it, or you see no new growth, that can give you an estimation of, hey, last year this tree was much more full. This year, it's not as full of new growth. I might have an infestation taking hold. And then, of course, limb die back from the bottom up, which sometimes cannot be the only way to tell because a hemlock that is in a really deep shaded area, the lower limbs are going to die back, of course, first because it's being shaded from all the other trees and the canopy it's of the tree um, that it's on itself. And then, of course, de total defoliation and death is definitely a sign, but now it's too late, right? This slide has been explained to me, and someone on, the, on this webinar might be able to explain it to me again so that it makes sense. But it really just goes to show you that how quickly by the end of two years, how many out of one egg sac, the potential could be 81 million woolly adelgids on a tree by the end of the second year. And so really why we show that we debated on this slide because to explain the math and to go over that with someone that's just really want to save the tree on their own property. The reason why we've kept this in here is to just really show that this is how a tree can go from being very healthy when someone says, oh, my tree's healthy, it's not infested, it can quickly go from in three to six years from complete uh, defoliation and death of the tree. So it is prolific. So if you see it, you can control it. So you see the egg sacs this time of year, early spring and in early summer, they become gray and tattered as they disintegrate. And then weather, rain and stuff, of course, will remove them from the tree. This is really only a, a great way to tell in the early spring or in the during summer and fall. But it's not as prolific. You don't see it as, as well in the summer and fall as you do in the early spring. And they're all cultural and chemical. And we mostly do chemical controls on public lands. And then there's biological and public lands. We have not moved into biological and private property. Our hope is that once you do that, if we can introduce a biological control that works really well on public lands, it will just naturally spread and eventually will spread to, of course, you can't control where the beetles would go. So hopefully that would help all property owners. So this is a repeat of a slide, but really it's just a decline in property value and it's unsightly and it's not safe as well. And it's not safe on trails like the Bent Mackay Trail or the Appalachian Trail. So those are those are concerns as well because they are they have they're a volunteer group as well that we help, but they're always having to play catch up on falling trees. And if we can save their hemlocks, that's that's definitely a help for them as well. Again, this is a repeat of what we've discussed so far. But what are we doing on public lands? We're just really trying to help with that loss of habitat and biodiversity and the change that it. it causes in the ecosystem. Again, the closing of trails and the risk to people that are out in the woods. And of course, increase in fire and hazard, fire hazard and soil erosion, as we mentioned, and apply imputing and enjoyment. And of course, our efforts to help our waterways. And one area I did, one thing I did not mention before is it does when the trees do fall, and this is on the river, on the Jay River that I live close to, you can see there are areas where large trees have fallen and you just, it's unsightly. Uh, to see this clog of, of, of limbs and dead branches that can be caused by a tree falling in the water that way. So it can clog waterways, which is not good. So that is the segment on the woolly adelgid itself and the impact that it can have. And so chemical treatments, there's choices and decisions to be made. Do you do it yourself or do you hire a professional? I don't think anyone on the call would hire a professional because you are professionals and you have done this before. For Property owners, we try to teach them which trees to treat. Some of them will grow in masses of 20 or 30 small saplings. You can't possibly treat the 20 or 30 in the wild without the woolly adelgid. Not all 30 of those trees would make it. One is really going to probably dominate, shade the other ones out, take over, and survive. The other ones are going to die. I have come across a small patch, and I will choose the healthiest one to save, and then the others I will let go. The other option is to... And not everyone has this time when you're out in a treatment project. I've done this on my own property is I will then treat that tree, maybe wait a year to see if there's any progress and then dig that out of that small clump, put those in a pot to let it get healthier and larger and we can transplant it somewhere else or donate that or sell it or move it somewhere else on my property. So that's what we mean by which trees to treat. And also there are some trees that are too far gone that unfortunately you just have to let it go. 
So we treat, teach them how to identify the health and the can, overall condition of the tree if it can be. If so, what kind of treatment? There are two chemicals that can be used, Safari 20 and then Imidacloprid. And so which one do we want to use? There is a cost difference between the two and how, it's, how it can be introduced to the tree is different as well. And then the application method. Of course, the timing, what to look for, when to do it, when not to do it, and how to see if you've been successful. And then, of course, teach them about the cost. It's always a question that comes up. And then there's a safety aspect to being out in the woods, as you very well may know. With hemlocks, they're, they're rarely on a flat surface, so it can be a little tricky. Like I mentioned, I was digging up some hemlocks, and I was on a steep hill, and it's not fun. So uh, you have to be careful and mindful. Now, of course, you want to be sure it's a hemlock. And I don't think in this group that's a problem. I have watched people treat pine trees. And so when you're doing a project and you're trying to treat as many trees as you can in a four or five hour span, and you only have so many chemicals, so much chemical and so many volunteers, you really want to be as efficient as you can. So is that going to hurt the pine tree? No. Is it a waste of our resources? Yes, it is. And so it does impact. And so we, of course, teach people how to identify, do you have a hemlock? And if you're treating, helping us do a treatment project, or do you know how to identify a hemlock? A hemlock of course. And then, of course, make sure that it's still alive, which is pretty easy to teach. When we do a treatment project, we choose the number of trees that we're going to treat, which ones based on condition, size, the site, and the cost to treat them. So on my first project, we do have a spreadsheet that's available on our website that you can download. It's a fantastic tool that I, of course, could not go out and measure two, 300 trees on my own. The Donna said we need to get an idea how much chemical we're going to need. And so after you measure so many trees, you can go, uh, that one's at least 10 inches. This has got to be at least 20 to 22 inches. You're trying to get a rough estimate to really, that's not how you're going to treat the tree. When you treat it, you're going to get an exact measurement. But when you are making the estimate to find out how much chemical am I going to need for this treatment project, that spreadsheet is fantastic. You can put in the number of trees. Of, there's a number of ways you can do it, but basically it totals the number of diameter inches and you say, which chemical am I going to use? And it'll tell you how much chemical you need to buy to treat that many diameter inches. Um, of course, we want to choose trees that are healthy enough to save. We want to get a mix of large ones, some in the middle, and then some of the, small, the smaller ones as well. So we have a succession plan, of course. We prioritize trees along waterways and trees with high visibility. We don't choose trees, of course, that are past saving growing too close together. So again, you may just choose one out of a clump of they're growing too close together or if they're in an undesirable location, which we've seen that before. I have one that's growing almost in the middle of a retaining wall. I've got to cut it down. I hate to, but it's that's going to destroy my retaining wall. So we have to, and if it's on a roadway or not in a safe place, definitely it, it should not be treated and probably removed. Once you've chosen trees that you want to stay, the next step is assessing the health because that governs the choice of treatment material that we're going to use. So we can look at it from two perspectives. My apologies. Individual branches to see how many egg sacs there are and the tree as a whole to see how much of it is affected. And so this is a card that we that we have at festivals that we give to anyone that attends the clinic. If it's a virtual clinic, we mail this to them. And this is a card that I refer to till this day to look at the level of infestation and what do I need to do. So all of these trees can be treated and saved but um, the last two heavy and the one that's in decline, heavy decline, those two, I may go with the Safari 20 product versus the light and moderate would use imidacloprid. So the types of treatment are non-systemic. So it has to fall directly on the exposed insects. They are not, they are not exposed at all times of the year. So you have to know when to spray this on there. So it's not very effective. It is safe, but it's not cost effective as well. And it doesn't provide any residual protection as well. So the only time that I typically will spray on it or use a, a non-systemic uh, solution is on a very small tree that I'm transplanting because it's getting, it's small. It needs as much help as it can possibly get in the moment. And it's going to be another year, six months to a year when I, if I put the immediate culprit in the soil, it's going to be a while before that tree gets any, any protection from the systemic treatment. The systemic chemical can be applied to the tree itself or to the insects. It is 95 to 99% effective. It's safe and cost effective and provides a period of residual protection. As I mentioned, five to seven years. So people say, when should I treat them? Treat them as soon as possible. With, for me, with as many trees as I have, it's not cost effective for me to hire it done. So I've chosen to do it myself. 
but I've had to do it in phases. And by the time I get to the end, it's going to be time to start over at the beginning again. So I'll constantly be treating hemlocks. So I got started as soon as I could, and I've gone as fast as I can, and I'm trying to get them all. I would love to get them all at one time, but I'm just going to have to do it in a system. But I tell people, just treat them as soon as you can. Spring is the best time, but year round is okay, except for when the soil is saturated or frozen or during a prolonged drought. And typically, I haven't had problems with our soil being oversaturated or really frozen as much as there have been times that we're in a prolonged drought. If you're in a really, if we haven't had uh, several weeks or months without good good rainfall, uh, probably not the best time to treat the tree. If you can, plan for a 12-hour window before or after the treatment with no rainfall. I like to do math when I'm out in the middle of the woods, so I really like the diameter tape. That's been very helpful. I think you can get those on Amazon. You measure it at the breast height, which is about four and a half feet above the ground. You can take rough measurements, of course, to get an estimate, but you want to take of how much chemical to purchase, as I mentioned earlier, but you want to take precise measurements to treat the trees. And I was talking to two of my neighbors last Friday, and we started chatting. They said, hey, can you send an email to the neighborhood neighborhood about the hemlocks? We're seeing the woolly adelgids. I said, yes, I can. And we started talking about the treatment, and I said, I want to simplify it for our neighbors so that we can encourage them to treat the trees, and I can tell them how to measure. And they said, oh, we don't even measure anymore. We just go in and start injecting. And I thought, if you're coming at it from that angle, you may not even, are you even measuring how you're diluting the the chemical with water? And so I told them, I said, the risk with that is that you could be applying a chemical to a tree, and it's not going to have an effect on the tree. So you're really, in essence, wasting chemical, and you're not doing the tree any favors. And they balked at it. And about three days later, they said, we have two, they said, we've got two or three trees that are fully covered with the woolly adelgids. We treated them two years ago. I don't know what's going on. And I thought, I know what's going on. You're not measuring the tree, so you're not injecting enough chemical. So that is why I reemphasize this is to measure the tree. Now, if you're a professional and you've done this enough, you can look at the tree and say, all right, that's at least 10 inches. I'm going to do one injection per inch. I'm going to inject this tree 10 times. But for someone that does this or has never done it before, only does this every five years to their trees, they should probably measure the tree. This was interesting to me when I first started was when you have a tree that has multiple, the trunk has split and it's at breast height, you measure all three of those and add that together. That is going to give you your your diameter. Instead of going, my inclination would have been to just go down lower on the tree, but then that's not going to give me the measurement that I need. Um... When measuring on a steep hill, you want to be up from the tree when you measure at breast height to get that diameter. So you want to stand upside the hill. This is a great product that is fairly recent in the past few years. It's Cortec Dry Tablets. Um, So we're going to go over, I'll just start from the bottom. The cost is a little bit more expensive than the uh, needed culprit. However, it does provide the same residual protection because this is a needed culprit. The speed of action is a little bit slower because this goes, you poke a hole in the ground with rebar or something and you drop the tablet in there and it dissolves slowly over time with rainfall. So if you're not getting a lot of rainfall, it's not going to dissolve as quickly. So you may have a slower time where it gets, is applied to the tree. And, And the purpose of this is it's great for trees that if you have a neighbor and you don't want to go through getting an injector and getting the liquid chemical and measuring and going through all of those, this is a little bit easier, right? And you can buy these and split them up amongst your neighbors and we've treated our trees and it's been a lot, of, it can be a little bit easier. So if you have one or two trees, this might be the process for you. There is a group of kayakers that will go out and they will get trees that are located close to the water. So they'll get out of their kayak and this is, doesn't require as much uh, equipment so it's easier for them to transport. So it's a great solution for trees that are difficult to get to when you're in a kayak and you can't get to the tree really any other way because it's so far off the beaten path, but it's right next to the water. This It's a great product and there's been a solution for that as well. So applying the dry tablets is the same as if you're doing the other chemicals. You're going to measure the diameter and then use a dosing chart, which is on our website, to determine how many tablets the tree is going to need. And this is the card that I'm referencing. We have these laminated that we will give to uh, to attendees when we do the facilitator training in person. And so it just tells you for how many tablets you're going to do per diameter inch of the tree at diameter height. So a 10 inch tree, you're going to apply 11 tablets. You can make 11 holes around the tree and just drop one in. 
But when you get up to a 35 inch tree, 71 holes, it might be a much bit difficult to do depending on how many, how many rocks, how many roots there are. You might only have so much area where you can get into those feeder roots. So um, which is anywhere from just six to 12 inches from the base of the tree, you're going to apply 71 tablets. As I mentioned, that can get a little costly. We're looking at, I think, 40 to 50 cents per tablet last time I checked. And But if you do go this direction, you're going to do multiple tablets per tree. So if you can only get 20 holes around the tree, that's the most you can get. You're going to do a little bit of math to determine how many holes you're, or how many tablets you're going to put in each hole. This is one of those slides where this is probably not new information to you. We scrape the duff back to really get to the base of the tree to also see is there a rock there or a root or is this a good area to apply to inject. And so I will clear all the duff around the tree first. And then for the Cortec, you use a piece of rebar four to five inches deep, as close to the trunk as possible, no further than 18 inches. And the number of holes should equal the dynam diameter of the trunk. Again, 71 holes would be tough, but 11 holes is not so tough to do. Put the number of tablets, required tablets into the holes, distribute them evenly. That's really the most important thing. And then, of course, press the soil. And then we put the any duff that was there that we pushed away, we put that back over the holes that we've done and um, we mark the tree. For me, this is really important because once I get out there in the woods, I think, oh, I'm, just, I'm going from the east to the west, so I know I can keep track of which trees I've done. And then 10 trees in, I'm looking going, did I treat that one and that one? Or did I get that too far? Or I've taken a break and I come back. So I've learned my lesson is to mark the tree in some way or fashion. I'm sure you are all familiar with the numbered tags that can be nailed into the tree. That is more for when we use those when we're doing this on more on public lands. For personal property, I just use some type of marker like a, a spray paint on the tree. I have had neighbors that actually will do the tags on their trees, and that's fine. But to, to me, this is a little bit easier to do. Our treatment projects, we will record, especially on public lands. When we go on public lands, we they will give us they will give us a clipboard with, and you can see how many trees, how many times that tree has been planted. And so that's why they use the number of tags. They'll say trees one through twenty-five or somewhere over here, go find them. And here's trees one through twenty-five. And as you measure tree number one, measure the diameter and record that. And you can see over time as the tree growing, if it's growing, then it's progressing, it's doing well, you know that the treatment is working. And it's lightweight, portable, cortex are safe to handle, a great for backcountry use, as I mentioned. It's not inexpensive, about 43. I'm sure now it's probably up to 50 or 60 cents a tablet and nothing gets cheaper. Depending on rainfall and watering to dissolve, how it becomes available to the tree. So again, if you don't have any rainfall, if you do this in the dry season, it's not going to dissolve until it starts to rain again. So when we talk about control, we're looking at uh, not all the bugs are dead, not all of the woolly adelgids are gone, but most of them are, and the tree is no longer in danger. So fewer egg sacs, new growth, better foliage color, foliage density, and overall vigor. And so really all of those things to, to look for. Again, you would know probably what to look for. Someone that's never done this before may not know, how do I tell if the tree's even doing any better? When should I see this effect? And once the chemical becomes available to the tree, anywhere from six to 18 months, that's a long window because it can just debate, it can depend on the size of the tree the health of the tree, the chemical you're using, and like I said, how large the tree is, it's going to take more time for a very large tree. When I say large for a hemlock, 20 inches or higher, you're looking maybe a year and a half. A 10-inch tree, probably within 6 to 12 months, you're going to start seeing some difference. So I just typically, I like to treat in the spring so that I can treat it. I know I have a year. Most trees are going to have an impact within a year, and I should start seeing new growth on the tree and then I know exact, so very little. So here's a chart, six months, 12 months, 18 months, just depending on the size of the tree. So I was a little ahead of myself on that one. With Amita clover, it's usually the following spring is when you see uh, the impact. I've had trees that are so large, when you get to a certain size, you wanna treat them two years in a row with Amita clover. Then after that second year, you're then on the five-year program. A, a tree that's 22, 25, 30 inches or larger, it may take a, a good year and a half, depending on the time of year. It may be two years before you start seeing that impact. So this is the pricing again. 
that is a duplicate slide. Of course, any pesticide that's misused can cause harm. They can be, the imidacloprid is the most common chemical used. It can be applied safely and used according to the product label. It is not a restricted use product. Of course, always read and follow application instructions. Consider site conditions. Uh, don't use too much, but don't use too little. So you cannot harm the tree with using too much chemical. If so, I probably would have killed more than I've saved. Don't let Donna know. And it's okay if you don't know an answer, you can always look it up um, on our website or call the help Hemlock Helpline. I think you guys all know this, but we let people know wear long plant pants, long sleeves, and sturdy footwear. I've learned the hard way of going out in tennis shoes, shorts, and a short sleeve shirt. I'm just going to hit a couple of trees and I come back completely scraped up. I came scraped up. I was wearing shorts the other day when I transplanted the trees. I thought, I'm only going to plant five, dig up five and plant five. And I had cuts all over my legs, so it's just best to be dress, especially when it gets warmer with, with insects. I don't want to have bug bites all over me. I've not wore, head covering is important. It can be as recommended in the woods, but I don't practice what I preach on that one. Be prepared for emergencies. And so we like to let people know. I always let, I always let my other half know, say, I'm going to go treat hemlock. If you don't hear from me within two hours, because I'll definitely need a break in two hours, come yell for me, look for me, have your phone with you. I've got my phone with me. If anything happens, People have been injured during our treatment projects and had, had, had needed medical care. It's not common, but it can happen. And so when you're alone in the woods, and I typically would rather be alone when I'm doing this for myself, it's a good idea to, to be prepared for emergencies. Um, there was no setback on waterways. There used to be, um, but not anymore. So that's fortunate because a lot of these trees go very close to the water, but you want to avoid runoff if you can or direct contact with surface water. So when we're mixing chemical, we tell people, do not, please do not use the same bucket that you're, or the same container that you're mixing the chemical in to rinse it out in the water. We don't want to do that. There was a two-year study using metoclopid within 50 feet of streams, and it was concluded that it can be used safely in your streams in the southern Appalachians. Systemic treatment products on plants where bees are feeding are likely to feed. However, hemlocks are not a source of nectar or pollen for for native bees, and that is a question we get almost every time that we have a we're at a festival and we encounter a lot of people. They want to know is this going to impact the bee population? And it does not because they're wind pollinated, not pollinated by bees. The advantages and disadvantages are it's the advantages are it's safe when used according to the label product label. It's economical, highly effective, and provides residual protection. It does involve some cost, or you must hire a professional if you don't do it yourself. And it's still only a temporary measure until we find a long-term solution. So unfortunately, it does have to be done every five years. So that is chemical treatment. So this is our website, savegeorgeshemlocks.org. Easy to remember. As I mentioned, this has come help, been helpful for me, even though I've been using the website for so long, is context are where to find stuff and resources are how to do stuff. And so there's just so much information out there. I still click double multiple times when I'm trying to find something. So when I had to find the, I was like, okay, let me get the most up-to-date presentation for today. I was clicking around until I found it, but it is a very useful uh, website. And there's our helpline number, which is of course all over our website as well. Don't know why that pops up, but there is, we do offer free on-site facilitator, facilitator visits. I do, I've done a lot of property assessments and helping folks. And to be honest with you, this is not typically what we do. If you're 20 minutes away from me and you have two hemlocks. Yes, I can come out and assess them, tell you what you need to do, tell you where you can get an injector, where you can get your chemical, how to teach you how to do it. You can, that type of thing. Or what I can do is when I go out there to assess it and you tell me you have two hemlocks, I'm going to bring my injector. You might, sometimes I'll encourage them to get the chemical because the chemical, you're going to need it in five years. And that way they're covering the cost of the chemical. So we don't do that. I have done that before for a friend, but but I will go out and help treat their tree. It's just easier for them, and it's just as easy for me if I'm going to go there anyway. So it's not that is not our typical process. What we typically will do, especially if they have a lot of trees, we will do that. We will go assess the trees. What's the health of the trees? What do we recommend? What do we think the what the cost could possibly be? And we will usually refer them to our website to help calculate them, them themselves. And we will also give them information for some people that we know that do apply the chemical. Everyone that we recommend on our website that can treat the trees for them do have a pesticide license. They are licensed in the state of Georgia. That was news to me when I first started that technically to do to charge to do that is what the state wants and requires. Not saying that's what always happens, but 
it is something we encourage people to do also so that they know somebody has been trained in that. But for me, that was news for me because I think pesticide license, I, of course, immediately go to turnaround inspection or home treatment for insects in your home, not out in nature. Um, but we do have links, a link out there that provides that information as also as to where to buy the immediate culprit. Some Ace Hardwares have that. Some other small mom and pops have them. Can't usually find them at a big box store. You can order them online through multiple places. So I always encourage people that are going to purchase chemical, go out there, peruse, and do some price checking. Sometimes it can there can be some price variance out there as well. Here. We ask people that are not going to use the Cortex tablet. The Cortex are great for personal property owners with just a few trees, as I mentioned. You are probably more familiar with the Amita Clopin and Safari 20 products. And those are done through the, applica the applicator of the Curoets um, or the EasyJet machine or tool. And the Safari 20 can also be sprayed on the trunk of the tree. It's a little bit more involved, and I have found that is not very effective. The first time I did that to several trees the next year, I saw absolutely no difference. And many variables, I could have mixed it wrong, I could have applied it wrong. If it's too windy, not as much product is going to get on the tree. You're going to have um, trees that are close to the river. When you do that, the spray is going to go into the water. And when you're having to wear a mask because you don't want to inhale that. When I learned I can inject the Safari 20, which is a much faster acting, but much more expensive chemical, I, when I learned you could inject it, uh, I have injected since then. And we have also played around with and tested if I have a tree that is very large and or in very heavy decline and it needs to be treated ASAP or it doesn't have another year to survive. And I need this, I need within eight to 10 weeks, I need to see results. We will use Safari 20. But that tree is also, that only lasts a year. So then you've got to come back a year later and treat it with a media culprit. And so what we have tested, and it has seemed to work well for us, is we can treat on the same day, treat the Safari 20 and the media culprit on the same tree on the same day. You get that residual protection on a tree that's under 20 inches. You're going to get five years. Over that, you're going to have to go back the next year and apply it again. But you've at least knocked it out at least one time while you're already there with the equipment you can go ahead and treat and retreat uh, both chemicals on the tree. Um, but I don't recommend the spray application method. It just doesn't seem to have the results that the injecting does. And so the hiring of professionals, as I mentioned, is on our contact page. We do have a schedule of events page. So the opportunity is to help, of course, is help your own trees. Or if you have clients that you're going to their property for another reason and that they have hemlocks that are in decline, of course, you can offer your services, or if you don't offer treatment of hemlocks, you can direct them towards us, and we can, we'll can we be more than glad to do a site assessment, invite them to our training, and help them in any other way that we possibly can. Our volunteer page, <clears throat> we have several treatment projects throughout North Georgia. We welcome anyone to, to join us. We will do, we have members that actually plant hemlock seeds and rear seedlings, or they will go out to properties that have multiple trees that they say, hey, you can come dig up all of these saplings and save them and sell them or use them for your planting. So if you really are into gardening and you really want to go that direction, you can. You can help with our planting projects, of course, treatment projects. And so all of that is out there on our website. We are going to, I think, later in the fall, we're going to have a treatment project at Fernbank in Atlanta. So if you're in the Atlanta area, we would welcome you to help with that. Otherwise, most of our treatment projects are going to be in North Georgia. And of course, if you want to become a volunteer facilitator, we appreciate if you want to help teach a clinic and facilitator training like I've done here today. We welcome that as well. So we're always in need of volunteers in many aspects of administrative to actual practical out in, in the wild. But overall, it's people like you that are key to saving the hemlocks and to key to spreading the word and letting people know about, about the problem that we have. And so this is the result we like to see as a very healthy for us. That concludes my presentation. I know that I went somewhere that quickly, some of it, but I think some of that was not new information for you. So I wanted to make sure that we concentrate on the areas that would be helpful for you. And as I mentioned, for someone that would want to go into like how to use the injector and the meta culprit in Safari 20, that's when we would invite them to the second segment of our training, which is what we call it the facilitator training. 
And we would actually do that in person and do a practical and a demonstration of all the equipment at the end of the segment. So, so that concludes our clinic presentation today. Thank you so much, Derek. It looks like we're a little bit over time, but do you mind sticking around in case anybody has oh, any Q&A? Of um, course. Yeah, if, if anybody has any questions for Derek, please drop them in the Q&A and we'll stick around for just a couple minutes in case you have questions. Um, otherwise, I dropped the CEU form in the chat. So if you need CEUs, please uh, fill out that form and I'll get them submitted to the ISA. Derek, do you see the, the Q&A? Oh, I do. One top top. We do have a question or a couple of questions here. Mm. Oh, okay. Great question. Percentage of hemlocks have been lost to the woolly adelgid in the U.S. I do not know throughout the U.S. I know that it can vary by state. I know that North Carolina has been, so I can't answer that question to be honest with you. I can guarantee you 100% of them are in, in infested or will be. I think that in North Carolina has been one of the hardest hit states. It can also depend on how many hemlocks do you have, right? So the more hemlocks you have, the faster that's going to spread, the closer they are together. And so some forces have been completely decimated and deforested because of that in North Carolina. And but as a, to a percentage, I would just say my best guess is you've got to look, it's got to be at least half because we can't get to all of them, right? And so the one map that wasn't on there is there's a, and just quickly, if you look at the map where public service, where the trees, they can't treat all the hemlocks in, in, in the forest. They will do, they spread it out, right? Because they only have so many resources. So it's almost like somebody just splattered polka dots on the map so that in the hopes that we come to a final solution to this problem, then they won't, if you just do it on the eastern side, it's going to take years before the seeds would spread over to the western side. So they're trying to do it so that they spread the wealth evenly so that it, once we find this final solution and they reseed themselves, it'll already be wide, widespread and evenly distributed. But So I would say that it's got to be over half because public service lands, people can't get, we can't get to all of them. They only have so many resources. Some 30 foot trees on my property in Atlanta, they appear healthy and pest free. I am out, uh, am I outside the um, Willie Adelgid zone? No, you are not. Um, so they, any anywhere there is a hemlock, the Willie Adelgid can survive. So up to Canada and really cold temperatures down to Atlanta where there are warm temperatures. I would definitely look into treating those trees. That's a large tree to have in Atlanta. I have seen that on one neighbor a few blocks from me has a very large hemlock tree. I was very surprised to see it, but it does happen. What other diseases and damage that damage hemlocks that can be mistaken for woolly adelgid? Okay, there are several. We have several cards, and I'll be honest with you, I cannot recall the names of them off the top of my head. And they're more, I think they're in our facilitator presentation. And I've seen the placard so many times I should have it memorized. I want to say one is like rosella, one is something rust. And typically what you'll see with those other diseases is you'll see very quick needle die back where they turn yellow or discolored before they fall off. With the woolly adelgid, it doesn't happen like in mass, right? It's over a, a three to six year period. So a few needles drop here, a few needles drop there, but you don't see this blight over a three or four foot segment of the tree in this area or over in that area. So the other, those are the signs of the other diseases. So then you have to, spider mite can also be an infestation, but see, that's going to be over a large segment of the tree. And so that's, that can be found on our, on our website as well of photos of all of the, of the progression of other diseases that can impact the hemlock. But the woolly adelgid is really just going to be like we talked about today, just it gets thinner and less vibrant looking. Uh, as of right now, no, there is no, they have, because they are concerned about that and they have tested for it. Is there any resistance in the hemlock? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm thinking, is there any resistance in the woolly adelgid to the chemical? And they have tested that. And so far, no. Um, is there any resistance in hemlock species? Yes, they have developed a species of hemlock that is resistant. This is very new. That's resistant to the woolly adelgid, but they're very, we're talking small trees because this has happened in the past few years, right? So it will take generations for that to really those trees to really to really be introduced to the wild to be the majority of the trees there is and they will not release the information of where this is at it's not in georgia there is a there's a small track of trees of hemlocks that have never been treated that have not that are not impacted by the woolly adelgid they have a natural resistance to the woolly adelgid and so that's i think probably was the source for part of the research they've done to develop uh, a tree that is resistant to woolly adulthood. Probably a silly question, I realize topical is not as effective, but what about aerial application by plain white light done in agriculture in highly concentrated areas? 
the disadvantage to that is the same as if you were just to treat one tree in your yard is you've got to apply it while they are not in the woolly. That woolly egg sac is protective, so it doesn't kill the eggs. It only kills active insects that are actively crawling. Once they adhere, they're less resistant to, to pesticides, so they need to be active and crawling. So that's a very small window, a couple times a year. So you have to get it at the right time, number one. Number two, you then have also applied a chemical to every other insect that can be killed while you're applying that applicate that topical to the woolly adelgid. So there's not there's not a product out there that when you put it on the tree, it only kills the woolly adelgid. It will kill all in, insects that come in touch with that. So that's the other uh, disadvantage to doing it in that that uh, method. To use a basal drench without injection, has this has this technique been compared to? Yes. So that is, I think we talk about that in, in our facilitator, because that is another method. If you don't want to do the rebar method, you can, I think this is what, they're, when they're saying basal drench, please correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, where you can pull away the soil, get down to the root, to the roots. You want to get to the feeder roots that are very close to the base of the tree. They're almost like a really woolly moss almost. And you can drench that, put the soil back. With hemlocks, this, I have done that. Before. I've done the rebar method and when I didn't have an injector. And it's just the same way with that process with the basal drench. If you're going out into the woods and you're on steep terrain and there's a lot of brush around you, it's just really difficult to get down underneath that tree to the trunk. So if you're doing one tree, two trees, probably not so bad, but it can be labor intensive, but it can be as effective. You just have to make sure that chemical gets to the root. Metacloprid and Safari 20 adhere to organic matter. So if you pour it on top of the soil or don't get down to those roots, it will adhere to the soil and not make it down to the root. So unfortunately, we can't pour it around the tree. That's why we have to inject it in there because it has to come in direct contact with the root to take it up into the tree. So I hope that Hope that answers that question correctly. Any hope with the GMO hemlock? That might be what they, I don't know how they've come up with that resistant hemlock, but my guess would be that's, I don't know the answer to this, but my guess would be they have introduced some type of genetic material from a resist, something that's resisting the woolly adelgid into those hemlocks. So those are not, I think they're still in an experimental phase, to be honest with you, because I know that we can't get our hands on them. So I don't think they're out there available. They're still doing some testing with that. And there it looks like Mark um, has uh, put a link in here of resistant hemlock, the resistant hemlock. And as far as I know, the last time that this was presented, I saw the presentation from someone that was actually involved in that. And that's been four or five years ago. They were not available to the public. And I have not heard any difference since then. And I'm sure that if we could, Donna would probably be right on it. Let's get some of these trees and let's get them out there. Because when we're doing planting projects, that would be fantastic if we could get trees that, hey, we just did a on this river, on this one mile, we did a resistant tree. We never have to treat these trees again. That would be fantastic. But as of right now, we can't get our hands on them. Why not every hemlock that shows an infestation? Seems that would be logical in order to control to control future pests. I think from what I understand from this question, if you see a tree that's healthy that does not have an, a visual infestation, I would treat it to control the future woolly delta because again, it's just a matter of time. And so I have neighbors that they'll have very healthy trees and I'll say, hey, do you know when you hemlock, you just bought this property. Do you know when your hemlocks were last treated? And some have said, oh, our neighbors told us they treated them two years ago. So we're good for another three years. I've had neighbors that have said, oh, I have no idea. I didn't even know. I didn't even ask them. I don't know if they've ever been treated. I say treat them and get it on the five-year program. So even if it doesn't need it or doesn't look like it needs it, I would head it off. I would not wait until you start seeing the woolly adelgid because you've already, the tree is now infested. It's already been weakened. It's fighting for its life. And I would go ahead and treat the tree if you don't know if it's been treated or not. That looks like all of the questions that we have today. So thank you so much, Derek. This has been a really informative session and I appreciate your time and the effort that you put into this. And um, hopefully we can all uh, meet you in person at a volunteer event sometime soon. Absolutely. And I'll definitely, we will be in touch with you, Jesse, and we'd like to get some materials to you. So I'll talk to you about that later um, that you can give to in, in one of your live meetings. And in any way that you can think that we can help you, please let me know. But again, I'll be, we'll be in contact with you in the very near future. Thank you so much for letting us uh, join you today. Sorry we went a little bit over, but I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having us.
Thank you. Have a great afternoon. All right, you too. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.